Hello, everybody. This is the great Johanna speaking for my uh, podcast session. I'm streaming this live on TikTok. You can always follow me there at the great Johannes is my username. Um, and the topic this time is going to be trying to decipher real history. We always know, say that history is written by the victors, right? And the victors, uh, they can lie. They can make stuff up. But is there no way at all in the human literary record to figure something out about real history? And yes, there is. There is this program called um, Google Ngram Viewer, and it tells you about the frequency of words and phrases in the writings of published books. Uh, we do have to keep in mind, though, that most books written in the world were written by men. So we are looking really at the intellectual preoccupations of male authors. And specifically now I'm going to look at, uh, I'm going to look at uh, the, the, the real history of humankind. Uh, give me a moment, please. And so uh, let me put it on screen and put the end viewer on screen over here. Let's see, here we go. So I have uh, set up a whole, a whole bunch of topics I can talk about now. Um, I wanted to show you, I started with this one. I wanted to show you that um, the phrase black people in English language over the past 500 years, of course, the phrase has been in use for a long time, but it didn't really gain much popularity until right around 1960, 1964 or so, where phrases like blacks, black people become very popular. Why is that? Well, it's because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which kind of fused um, black and white people together in the same spaces. Until 1964, blacks and whites in the USA or in the, Ang in the Anglosphere, the English language sphere, they really didn't live together. They were separated, remember? You had uh, racial separation, racial segregation, which kind of ended in, uh, in 1964. And then all of a sudden, you need to give them a name. You got to imagine that a large group of white people until 1964, it really did not live with the black people, especially not in the USA. And afterwards, it changes and they start giving each other names such as blacks and black people. Uh, I just want to give you some more examples of how to interpret this Google Ngram viewer. It shows you the frequency of words in English language over the past 500 years, right? And so I'll give you another example, uh, this one of serial killers. Now you can see, and this is very interesting, is that, let me zoom it in for you a little bit. I'm gonna shorten the time scale here from 1900. So, or even, I can do it even better because we don't really start talking about serial killers until around, what is it, 1980s, 1985. That's when the topic of serial killers becomes really popular in our culture for the past, just the past, say 50 or 60 years we've been talking about serial kills. Why is that? That's odd, isn't it? And I thought about this for a while. What changed in the right 1980s that all of a sudden gets people to talk about serial killers? Well, I suppose it's technology, right? You have uh, the technology to uh, uh, like detect fingerprints, for example, detect DNA, for example, and so we figure out now that many murders are being committed by the same people. Imagine that before this kind of technology became available, we didn't know. In the, if you were living in 1800s London, you could commit a murder and no one would know because they couldn't detect your fingerprints. They couldn't detect your DNA. They didn't have surveillance cameras. They had no cell phones, right? You could commit murder and get away with it. And so what changed is with the use of technology, we started to find out that murders were being committed by the same people, right? We could match three different murders and say to each other, okay, these three murders, they have the same hair or the same footprints or the same fingerprints. Hey, this is the same killer. So imagine that in the past, of course, there were also serial killers in the past, but we didn't know about it because you had to be caught in the act to be really uh, convicted of murder. If no one saw you kill somebody in the year 70, 70, 1750 in a forest somebody, somewhere, 
you got away with it because no one saw you do it. No one could trace you. That was it. You got away with it. So let's do another example of, uh, of uh, interpreting the engrams. Here, let's do feminism. Feminism, meaning, again, what are we looking at, this graph? We're looking at the frequency of the word feminism in English language literature, but it's mostly written by men, right? Of course, this also includes the female authors, but it's mostly by men. So what are we looking at here is men's preoccupation with the topic of feminism doesn't really start until around 1960s, 1970. And then what we see, it becomes very popular around, say, 1990. And you can combine this now with another phrase, patriarchy. And you see that we don't really start talking about the patriarchy also until we start talking about feminism. So let me zoom out a little bit from the early 1500s again. Here, <laughs> this shows it very clearly, right? Uh, it shows you that feminism, patriarchy and such things we're not on anybody's minds until the 1900s. They start talking about feminism a little bit, and then they start talking about patriarchy later. How do we interpret these results? Um, we can say, for example, that the patriarchy didn't really exist and that the patriarchy is an invention of feminists because they're the ones who start talking about it in the 1960s and 70s. We can also interpret it differently, of course. We can also say that Patriarchy was considered such a normal, general thing that nobody bothered to question it until feminists start questioning it. That is also uh, a way of interpreting this. So here I'm not really sure what it is. I personally don't feel that I am living in a patriarchy or that I'm benefiting from a patriarchal system. I don't see the benefits really. So it could be a feminist invention, could be a feminist fiction. Now let's talk about, now let's interpret something more. Let's do goyim. Here, the word goyim in different uh, case sensitive spellings doesn't really gain popularity until, until 1925 or so. This is before World War II, they start talking about the goyim, right? Although the word does seem to start around 1800 something. But why is it? Why, did, why do people start talking about the Goyim? Well, we can connect this to another word called Zionism. Oh, <laughs> uh, let me zoom in again. This explains a lot. So it is only when men in the English sphere start writing about Zionism that then also the word Goyim becomes more popular. Perhaps this is what happened. Uh, we start writing more about Zionism, and in turn, they start calling us Goyim, right? So I just wanted to give you first up front some, of, uh, some examples of how to interpret the, uh, the Engram view, right? And uh, now I want to do some much more interesting stuff. So I see there's some people on my live show already watching. That's really great. I'm going to be talking mostly about uh, what I have to say now about this program because I'm doing my live podcast now. Uh, I may have a look at the comment section once in a while if I see something over here and there. Uh, feel free to share. And also, if you want to subscribe to my newsletter, it's www.jmk.info. JMK, those are my initials. So let's move on to interpreting some even more interesting stuff. Uh, I noticed something, something I thought was very interesting, is the notion of relativity. Watch. People around the world, in English, in English language, don't really start thinking or writing about the concept of relativity. And why is it that it starts around here, 1850s, 1860s, that's when we start talking about relativity. What happened then in the 1850s? Well, I can tell you right now. You need to know a little bit about history to be able to truly interpret these, these things about... Karl Marx happened, obviously. 
uh, Karl Marx and the revolutions of 1848 throughout Europe, throughout the Western world. We had massive revolutions right here around 1850 or so. And what changed because of those revolutions? All of a sudden, we start questioning everything. And everything becomes relative because of it. In fact, I'll, I'll prove it to you. Here you have relativity. Uh, I can also write about moral relativity, right? And watch. It's almost the same graph. Around the 1850s, the idea of moral relativity is born. And it becomes popular here around uh, 1920 or so. So that's around the First World War. And around the Second World War, moral relativity all of a sudden is a very big concept. And I can also link this to uh, the theory of relativity, relativity, which is Einstein's theory, remember? Oh, what a surprise. What a surprise. Again, and I, the, the talk of a theory of relativity comes around around the 1860s, but then Einstein in the early 1900s popularizes it with this theory of relativity, namely that time is relative. Oh, see? So we, we are living in, a in a, the modern age is really marked by a belief in relativity. Time is relative, right? Physics is relative. Everything is relative. Morality is relative. And let me guess, what about cultural relativity? Oh. What a surprise. The whole idea of relativity becomes so popular and it infects our whole civilization. Cultural relative, relativity, moral relativity, theory of relativity, time is relative, everything's relative. And why would they do that? Why would they care about making everything relative? Well, if you make everything relative, then you can say that our culture is not the best. And that's what it's really all about. It's about undermining our sense of being good, doing good. No. You're not really good. You're just as bad as everybody else. It's all relative, right? And you may see yourself as good, but when enemies call you bad, they are still right about you. They can just call you bad. Okay, let's move on to another topic. So we've seen relativity here. And then I noticed something really funny as well uh, about the scientific worldview. Look, nobody really talks about the scientific worldview until around 1950, 1960, and it doesn't really become popular until the 1980s. In fact, it is during the 1980s that the scientific worldview as an idea becomes popular. What's going on here? I had to think about this one for a little while. And then I noticed something, is that the idea of the scientific worldview was uh, thought of during the 1960s and 70s, uh, which is, can you guess what that was? Why are the 1960s and 70s so important? That's when you have the Apollo space program. Remember, 1969, they say, allegedly, we, la we landed on the moon. Uh, and, and as a result of that, what is the moon landing really in cultural terms? You know the story of Christ and his resurrection? Christ resurrects, goes to his father who is in heaven. We, put, we use technology to put a man on the moon, if you believe that. I actually don't believe that. But let's say we put a man on the moon using technology. What do you have? You have a new religion, a new religion that starts with the technological reenactment of Christ's resurrection. We put a man on the moon with rockets, right? And spaceships. And all of a sudden, the Christian religion is almost transformed into something else, the scientific worldview. Uh, but, not everybody believes that we put a man on the moon. And can you guess what happens? Around the same time, another phrase, conspiracy theorists, becomes very popular. So again, the, right after the 1960s, 70s, 1980s, we've seen the Apollo space program, we've seen the man on the moon on TV, right? The scientific worldview starts getting pushed out into the classrooms, in schools in during the 1980s and lo and behold people who don't believe in it are conspiracy theorists and also around this time of course john f kennedy is killed so if you don't believe the man on the moon was real you're a conspiracy theorist if you don't believe that you know some random dude shot john f kennedy you're a conspiracy theorist right and the whole idea of conspiracy theorists I guess it is amplified again. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more. Because we get to 9-11, uh, right? Here, 2001, 2003, 
Yeah, then it, well, it takes, it continues rather, right? So we start using the word conspiracy theorist to smack down anybody who doesn't believe the official story of 9-11 or the official story of the Apollo space program or the official story of uh, uh, John F. Kennedy. It's all tied into this stuff, right? Yeah, but let me show you another term that I thought was really very interesting. Holocaust. Now let's zoom out first because the term Holocaust, Holocausto really means burnt offering. And in this sense, as a burnt offering, it has been around, the term has been around for a long time. But as you can see, the term Holocaust really doesn't gain much popularity until around 17, 1967 to 1970. And what happened in 1967? Well, I'll tell you what happened. So you map real history or known history onto it, uh, Six Day War. The Six Day War happened in Israel. Israel started fighting uh, Egypt and whoever and, uh, and its enemies around it. All of a sudden, let me zoom in again so you can clearly see that no one, no one really, no one was talking about the Holocaust right after or during the, the so-called World War II. Wait, I need a little more of that. Let's go back to 1930. So the idea of the Holocaust really becomes popular around 1970, I believe in response to threats against Israel. The Israeli people, the Zionists, they feel threatened and they start talking about the Holocaust. They really popularize it even into our time today. But look here, 1940, no one talks about the Holocaust in 1940, 1945. Almost no one talks about it in 1945. 1950, no one. 1960, no one. It doesn't become popular as an idea until 1970, and it really reaches its height of discussion around the 2000s. I believe the word Holocaust only gained relevance uh, because of Israel, because of the Israeli. Uh, but let's move on to some more interesting things. I was also interested in Christianity. When exactly did Christianity really become a topic that people loved writing about? Let me zoom out again. So here you, here you see the frequency of the phrase Christianity in different, uh, different capital spellings. And Christianity in the English sphere becomes a really important topic around the year 1650. But by 1750, it already loses some interest. And by 1850, the interest in Christianity as a topic to write about really wanes until we see somewhat of a revival in our time, actually. We, have a, we are actually living in a Christian revival time <clears throat> around the year 2000. But for 200 years, from 1650 to, to 1850, uh, Authors writing in English seem to have a massive interest in the topic of Christianity. Uh, and let's also look, uh, it's not a coincidence here because we are, let's also look up Jesus Christ for a moment. Same thing, right? The, I, the, the topic of writing about Jesus Christ gains momentum in 1650. Okay, there's another spike here around 1550, but these earlier spikes, I consider them kind of anomalies it may be that the Google Ngram system tracked uh, like a, a smaller set or something, but you can see that, you know, the real during interest in Christ is from 1650 to around uh, 1750, then a little bit more until 1850. But then again, Christ as a topic loses interest until our time in the early 2000s, people start talking about Jesus again. I thought that was very interesting that we are, we are actually living in the revival of a, of a Christian uh, religious age. Uh, but around this time, we also have, for example, what about Jews and Judaism? Jews, Judaism. Oh, I miswrote that. Jews are a big issue are precisely during that Christian age, right? Um, Christianity. Uh, from 1650 to 1850, when Christianity is like most important to us in the English world, that's when we also speak about Jews. And interestingly, that is also when we start talking about a bigger concept called 
oh, this one is a bit messy. Like I said, the earlier spikes over here, I consider them anomalies, but we start talking about the Milky Way also around 1650 when Christianity becomes important. <clears throat> and here you see this, uh, the green and the red line are actually the same, but they are different spellings. Uh, in red, we write it with a capital M, capital W, and in green, it is written in uh, lowercase letters only. So you got to kind of interpret these as one line. <clears throat> so when, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. My voice is cracking up. <clears throat> and I wanted to talk about the Milky Way a little bit because also the concept of a universe a universe. Also, again, right when we in the West start talking about Christianity, about Jesus Christ, that's when we also ta start talking about the Milky Way. That's our galaxy, the one we live in. And we talk about the universe. All of a sudden, this, all these concepts come together as though we are expanding our intellectual minds and now making room for a lot of other things that we can then also start talking about. So uh, let's look at the term civilization. I thought this one was very interesting. We don't really talk about civilization that much until around 1750 or after 1750. The notion of civilization becomes very important. And I think uh, I will show you that it relates to some other things. Uh, for example, if I would type in humanity to add it to it, wait, humanity. Uh, here you see in red is humanity, humanity, blue is civilization. Uh, as you saw earlier, around 1650, we take a deep interest in Christianity. We write about it, about Christ and so on. And then uh, f f moving into the topics of humanity and then civilization. I think this has something to do with the fact that during the Christian age was an age of turmoil, of strife and struggle. Things were hard for us, right? And so we use Christianity or our faith to move through those difficult times. But then when we come out of them, when we come out of the difficulty, out of the strife and struggle of the 17th century, 18th century, then all of a sudden we want to make things more civilized. And we start talking about civilization from around 1750 onward. Because, okay, we've achieved a lot as a people in the past 500 years or so, right? But now... We want to organize things. We want to have a proper society. We start caring about things like humanity and then also civilization. And what I thought was also interesting, if I add the word culture to this, let's see how that maps out. Culture. How to interpret this? So the notion of culture really becomes popular around 1950 after the Second World War. And why is that? You know what I think it has to do what it has to do with? Wealth. It isn't really until 1950 that the Western middle class becomes wealthy, all right? Or even the notion, I'll talk about this later, but even the notion of middle class doesn't really arise until around the 1900s. And as we start having more money to spend and more wealth and more energy to use, then all of a sudden, we start talking about culture. And I'll show you that the rise of the notion of culture in the 20th century, just the past 100 years, has something to do with oil, gas, and coal. Look, we start talking or thinking about oil, gas, and coal from around 1850, and it becomes a real big issue around 1900. And that is around the time when we also start caring about culture. All of a sudden, we have energy in our hands that we can use to do stuff. And we, what, we, what do we want to do with it? Make culture. I don't know. Let's, let me check some other things. Uh, climate, we, showed, we looked at culture, but climate, the idea of a climate also starts around 1750, uh, kind of loses a little bit of interest uh, until the Second World War, and then the idea of climate is revived. But as you can see, you will see now, is that the notion of climate change is an entirely modern notion. Nobody really cared about climate change until around 1980s. <laughs> it's very late. We, we've only been caring about the climate for the past 50 years. Before that, no one gave a damn. Uh, let me check about, uh, what else did I have to say? Oh yeah, I wanted to check out platonic love. 
Here, platonic love has a, an anomaly around 1600 something, 1500 something. But if you look at it from say, where does it really pick up the idea of platonic love? Around 1750. And then you can compare that to romantic love. Romantic love. Here, romantic love and platonic love as ideas really become popular around 1750, but it's romantic love that eventually wins out, especially during the 20th century. The 20th century, the century of culture, of coal, gas, and oil, of energy, when we have something to do, what do we spend it on? We spend it on culture and romantic love. We want to be loved. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That when you have money, you want to be loved. Uh, and I also had a little fun with the phrase Odin. I'm going through a lot of phrases. Uh, if you're watching this, it's maybe a little bit random, but there's actually a structure in, in it, and I'll, I'll talk about it near the end of the video. I'll have a sort of a conclusion where I tell you about what, I, what the hell I think is really going on in the Western sphere for the past 500 years. But here, look, the phrase Odin, uh, in different uh, case-sensitive spellings, Again, Odin becomes very popular, gets a real spike over here around 17, 17 something, 1760s, and their spike is around 1772, all right? What happened around those times, in that time? Uh, well, I'll show you here in the Google. Uh, 1776 is the declaration, right? The Declaration of Independence is what happened. So that's very interesting that leading up to the Declaration of Independence, which uh, was issued here uh, in 1776, leading up to the US independence from the, from the British Empire, you see that people from 1750 to the 1770s take a massive interest in Odin. I thought that was funny. Of course, this doesn't mean Odin was more popular than Jesus. No, Jesus was way more popular. I'll, I'll show you the interest in the word Jesus compared to it. Clearly, Jesus was way more popular than Odin throughout all this time. So that's not the issue. The issue is that Odin, uh, a, an interest in Odin spikes right before the, the, the US independence from Britain. I thought that was funny that such an archetype, Odin is an archetype, the archetype of war and conflict, the, the leader of the dead, right? The leader of the dead soldiers comes into play. And now what's happening here, possibly under the influence of Marvel Comics, there's a revival of the belief in Odin in our time, in the early 2000s. And I wonder what is this going to lead to? Another kind of breakup, perhaps, perhaps between Europe and the United States, perhaps NATO is going to break up. Who knows? Something I think is going to happen when Odin shows up. Something is going to happen. Uh, but oh, this one was interesting. What about Santa Claus? Let me map it onto Odin. And that's what I thought. Uh, Santa Claus around 1900, like 1850 to 1900, Santa Claus kind of takes over from Odin. And that is probably because Santa Claus is the commercial version of Odin, right? Santa Claus is a cultural invention of the United States based on St. Nicholas from Europe, uh, but clearly a commercialized version of Odin, right? The one who brings you the Christmas gifts. And now, uh, now it's really in December, Santa Claus is the Coca-Cola logo, right? All right. Uh, okay. And then you have... Ah, I wanted to also touch on something random here. The notion of a solar system where the sun is the center and the earth revolves around the sun. That doesn't really come into play until around 1700. Now, the idea of a solar system was actually invented in a book called the Corpus Hermeticum, written by a man by the name of Hermes Trismegistus. Uh, but that, that idea doesn't really catch on until the 1600s when um, uh, you have Copernicus and Giordano Bruno writing about this. And then finally around 1700 something, uh, people pick up on the notion. Can you imagine that? Nobody really believed that the sun was the center of our of our anything until 1700. And then it becomes a thing that we start believing in. Uh, and in the English sphere, when does Islam become important? Here you see it. Islam has been mentioned often, but it doesn't really, Islam doesn't really mean anything to us until 1950. 
possibly because in 1950 we start having mass Islamic immigration into Europe from then on, right? And now all of a sudden Islam becomes an issue to us. That's when we start talking about it. And let's map this onto Buddhism as well. Here, same thing with Buddhism. Around, from around 1800, the concept of Islam and Buddhism becomes uh, prescient or prevalent to us or relevant to us, all right? And then we start talking about these people. We're really, here in the earlier age, when you saw that Christianity was a really big thing from 1650 to 1850, and then Christianity wanes and we seem to be taking an interest in what other people are doing, all right? So we change our, our mental outlook a lot. Uh, here, and then let's, let's talk about the colonial age for a moment. Because here, no one speaks of a colonial age until around 1850. That doesn't mean that's when it started, that's probably when it ended. Because when the, when the age is over, the age of colonialism is over, that's when we start writing about it to reflect upon it. So in the Western Anglosphere, we start writing about the colonial age from around 1850 or so. It becomes a thing, a thing of the past. But I wanted to show you this in connection to it, colonialism, colonialism, colonialism doesn't become an ism until around after, the, after World War II, around 1950. So that's interesting. We, we speak of the colonial age from around 1850, and it takes us a full century to start speaking about colonialism as an ism. Uh, and that is probably because after World War II, all of a sudden, white people bad, right? And so we start talking about things in a negative way. Uh, let me talk about, oh, <laughs> I want to show you the N-word. The N-word does not really come into swing until around 1825, and it remains kind of in an undiminished use until uh, into our time, probably in our time, probably under the influence of rap music, right? It's not white people doing this, it's rap music. But that's very interesting uh, because you can combine this now also with the phrase uh, slavery. So slavery has been around for a long time, but the topic of slavery loses its interest around 1850. Probably that's when slavery simply came to a halt. You know, combining a lot of, wait, uh, you I know this is very random, but look, I have to connect this slavery and the N-word with another device called the sextant. The sextant is a device that allowed people to trans transverse or traverse the oceans. So you can use the stars and the sun and so on to uh, determine exactly where you are on a map. And so the sextant was officially invented around 1734, but you can see that the sextant as a device that allows big ships to sail the oceans to circumnavigate the world does not really become popular until around 1800. And this is very important. Without this device, it was very, very hard to sail the big oceans. So big oceanic travel really did not happen until around 1800. Of course, it was possible before that, but the big, the big large scale colonial activity really did not happen until 1800. Uh, and if you can see that slavery, let's put sex down next to slavery. Oh, this is a bit unclear this way, but let's look at slavery separately then. Slavery as a topic really ends around 1850, right? Uh, so what I mean to say by this is, I am of the opinion, we, we like to speak about 400 years of slavery and 500 years of Western colonialism, but if I interpret things like the sextant, which allowed for oceanic travel, and the word for slavery, which loses its interest or popularity around 1850, you might draw a very different conclusion, namely that the colonial age kind of existed for 500 years, but the majority, the, the brunt of the activity of colonialism happened from 1800 to 1850. It is in those 50 years that we start bringing in the black slaves to the USA. Not at all earlier than that. Of course, there was slavery before that. Yes, I know that. Slavery was before that. It does, it did exist. I'm not saying that there was no slavery before 1800. But if you combine the word sex down, which allows for oceanic travel, combine it with the word slavery, which kind of ends around 1850, and combine that with the N-word, what does it show you? It shows you a very different picture. It shows you that from 1800 to 1850, that's when the majority of the blacks were really brought over to the USA. Because why, you know, it's not like they didn't exist before that, but the combination of these, 
of our human interest, the English language interest in these topics betrays something. It reveals something. It reveals that although colonialism may have lasted for centuries, slavery existed for many centuries, the, the height of it, like the, the large body of the activity was just from 1800 to 1850 and not at all 400 years of slavery. It looks more like there was 150 years of poor treatment of the N-word people from 1800 to 1950, because in 1950 you get the uh, Emancipation Act, right? When all of a sudden they're made equal. So it's not 400 years, it's more like half a century of terrible slavery, and then it already starts to end and unwind itself, you know? Okay, I showed you, did I show you this one already? Judeo-Christian. Because in the, the notion of a Judeo-Christian shared history did not really come about until uh, 1939, around the time of uh, the Hitlerites. So, although the, of course the idea of Judeo-Christian uh, Christianity was invented earlier, but didn't really become popular until around the, the Second World War. And why is that? Because in 1948, let me zoom this one in a little bit more, from 1930 on, wait because it has something to do with Israel. Here, 1930s or so, this is when the idea of a Judeo-Christian unity, as though it were one thing we have shared, oh, we share the same commandments, no, we don't. I think Jews have different commandments anyway. They've got the, the Talmud, we don't have the Talmud. But the, the idea of a Judeo-Christian unity, what does it really serve? It serves the protection of Israel. The Jews are a small minority of people. And now all of a sudden, despite the fact that the World War II just happened and they allegedly were all killed off, now they need us to defend Israel for them. They need us on their side against Islam. All right? And I wanted to combine this one with Indo-European. And I need to zoom it out a little bit so you can clearly see what's going on here. 1800, wait. 1800. The notion of a uh, cultural or linguistic fusion of Indian people from India and European people from Europe doesn't really arise until, uh, doesn't really become popular until around the 1860s. It was thought of before that. But what happened here, what really happened here during the 1850s? Well, the British Empire happened. I made a video about this on my TikTok, but the... Um, the word Indo-European uh, came into play because of the British Empire. They captured India, and they were heavily influential in Europe. And so if you could just fuse India with Europe, then you would have a massive empire to rule if you could do it. And what is my problem with this? My problem is largely that the steppe raiders, the steppe pastoralists living in Eurasia from, of the Pontic steppe north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. They were neither European nor Indian. They were white people, white pale skinned people, but they were not Indian people and they were not Europeans yet, right? So these people, a group of them moves into Europe and heavily influences, say, German and Celtic languages. Another group of them moves into Northwestern India and they influence the India languages. So sure, India and Europe both have this step pastoralist influence. That is true, but that doesn't fuse India to Europe. India and Europe still remain separate. And it's hard to explain this because you have to have a little bit of an IQ to grasp that there's, there are three parties over here, India, Europe, and the step pastoralists. Three parties, the step pastoralists influence both, influence both, of, both of the other parties, right? But that doesn't mean India influenced Europe. It doesn't mean that Hindu comes from German or that German comes from Hindu. No, German and Hindu were both influenced by the steppe languages, the Nordic steppe languages. So that's how it really was. And so after uh, the 1800s or so, you have Dumézil and others writing about Indo-European mythology as though it were something that has a similar origin. And to some extent, again, the steppe pastoralists and their beliefs influenced India and then separately also influenced Europe. But that just doesn't mean that India and Europe have an, uh, um, a similar uh, origin. 
And that is because maybe I need to explain this. India was already full of people when the step pastoralists arrived. Europe was already full of white people when the step pastoralists arrived. So that's my point. There were already people living there who had their own languages and their own culture. And it's not true that German language is purely uh, Indo-European anyway, uh, because German as a language still contains, what, for example, strong verbs. And strong verbs are actually from the language that was spoken before the arrival of the Aryan pastoralists. So there's a lot of, uh, there is some, some degree of mixing going on here. Uh, personally, I believe that possibly Odin was a sort of god of death that already existed before the arrival of the Indo-Europeans. Either way, and that's because the word for Woden, Odin, Woden, Wodanas, Wodas, Wodnas, and then there is a Celtic word, Vates, which means seer or prophesizer or prophecy. So maybe Odin comes from the Celtic ancestors, who knows? Okay, I'm going to move into the final chapter of this video. I'm 40 minutes in, I think I can do it in 20 more minutes or so. And so there's this, uh, we are entering the age of technology. Let me show you, let me start, let's start with this one, higher education. If you're still with me from the start of this video, I'm going to like kind of explain where things are going now. The whole notion of higher education, like university education, starts around 1850. Why? I told you about Karl Marx before, right? In 1848, we have the revolutions in Europe and the Western world, right? And everything changes. All of a sudden, they want to elevate the people. They want to make people smart. And what do they do? They start giving people higher education. And it becomes really prevalent around 1940. But what happens when you give people the higher education? you get a middle class out of it. Oh, let me re re rephrase that. You get a middle class out of it. So the, middle, the idea of a middle class is older, of course, but it doesn't really become popular in the Western world until the 1950s. And why is that? See, this is something that I always talked about, is that I believe personally that the Western middle class did not become truly wealthy until after World War II, because that's when we get higher education, starts in the 1900s, right? And that's when we have, I showed you before, but I'll show it again, coal, oil, and gas coming on. Uh, here also, 1800, in the 19th, the 20th century is the century of the middle class, where we have a ton of energy, we care about culture, we start caring about romantic love, I showed you this before, all right? And, and that is when our middle class becomes truly wealthy. But, let me talk about the middle class for a bit longer. Here you see again the middle class really become as an idea, right, becomes a concept around the 1950s, very popular. And what happens next? Well, our elites know all about this. The elites ruling the West, they see the middle class, the Western middle class, as a foreign entity, as an enemy almost. And, and because if you can no longer attack, if you can no longer get the resources from Africa, you can no longer get what you want from India, you can no longer get Russia, or and you can you could never capture China anyway then there's one more wealthy sphere that you might grasp, grab and attack, the middle class. <clears throat> this is why I'm gonna make a prediction now. By the year 2050 in the Western world, the middle class will have largely disappeared. Agenda, Agenda 2030 says you're gonna to have to rent everything, own nothing and be happy. Eat bugs, live in a pod. They're actually gonna do that because the middle class today in the West is still very wealthy, but not organized. We don't have leadership because our leaders are traitors. Our leaders are the elites or working for the elites. They don't care about us. They're not going to show us the way. And since the majority of people keep watching the evening news, thinking that that's the truth, you know, we're screwed. The middle class is going to die out. They're going to plunder, pillage the middle class. And how are they going to do it? With immigrants, of course. They're going to use the immigrants to attack the white middle class in the Western world, not to make the immigrants wealthy. They're just using the immigrants to take the white middle class wealth and give it to the elites. And then everybody will be living in a pod, eating bugs, on welfare or whatever, right? They're just using the minorities, so-called minorities, because the minorities are a global majority, whites are a global minority, but they're gonna use the minorities to take the wealth from the Western middle class, largely white middle class, and they're gonna give it to the elites, and that's the end of the middle class. There will never be a middle class again, or at least not in the next few centuries. 
uh, oh, I wanted to talk about this one. Relating to this, you have the idea of communism. Communism as an idea is very popularized since Karl Marx, obviously, the Communist Manifesto of Friedrich Engels, but then it doesn't really become popular until around the time of the First World War. Since the early 1900s, all of a sudden, the idea of communism really blows up. And we can combine this with the idea of nationalism. You see, let me zoom in for you a little, little bit from 1800 or so. So nationalism and communism as concepts become very interesting topics to write books about since around 1900s and then really after around World War II. Why is it? Why do we have communism and, and nationalism here? Because it is the 20th century, I showed you, coal, gas, oil. The 20th century in the Western world, we've got the energy, right? We've got culture or we want culture, right? And we have a middle class. But what are we going to do with all this wealth? Well, the communists say we should give it to everybody else. We should give it away to everybody else. And the nationalists say, no, 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 it's ours. We worked for this. We worked for this. This is ours. We can, get, we get, we can have it. We can keep it. Right? So you have this conflict between nationalists who say we should invest our wealth in our own offspring, our own future generations, and the communists say, no, 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 we need to give it away to the world and build the global open society. Right? So that's why we have this conflict now from around 1900. It is really a struggle of the direction of what to do with the wealth that we have in the Western world. Should we spend it on ourselves you know, to, to fund ourselves for the future, or should we take it out of ourselves, kill ourselves off, you know, the childless life, the child-free life, for example, as a lifestyle, right? Be LGBT, kill off the middle class, rip them, you know, slash them, plunder them, pillage them, you know, we're fucked, basically. <laughs> I, wish, I wish we could somehow, I don't know, beat some sense into the middle class, all right, and get everybody to understand everything. Okay, uh, let me just check on renewables for a moment. So the idea of renewable energy. So uh, uh, remember, the 20th century was the age of coal, gas, and oil. And now we're talking about renewables. But it is a really modern concept. Again, since around the 1980s, we start worrying about renewables, right? Uh, and then I wanted to talk about... No, right. 20th century is also the century of economy here around... World War II, we start talking more and more about the economy as a concept. And I can, you can link this to stock market also, I believe. Well, you know, okay, economy, economic life, seeing life as an economic struggle is really a modern concept from the 1800s and so on, 1900s, probably because we have so much wealth. You can't really talk about eco economics if you don't actually have wealth. The Western world now has the wealth, so we talk about the economics, right? But perhaps I wanted to link this up with technology. You think technology is ancient. Sure, there's always tools and technology. But technology as a broad concept is a really something that started around 1950, after the World War II. And uh, this has something to do with something else as well. Look at space travel. Space travel, again, becomes a very popular concept around 1950, leading up to the moon landings, right? Uh, same with the space age. Nobody spoke of the space age until around 1950. Or even the concept of an outer space is also a very modern concept, right? Here, the idea exists previously, but it does not become popular until around 1950. So imagine this. The 20th century, the century of wealth, oil, gas, energy, we've got it all but we've got no, nothing left to conquer. The colonial age is over. So uh, you have to imagine from 1650 to 1850 was really the truly religious age. From around uh, 1750 to 1900 was our real colonial age. And then all of a sudden we've got nothing to do. We can't conquer, we can't take China, we can't take Russia, we can't take India. What are we gonna do now? So we focus, we shift our attention to outer space, to space travel, and then the elites, they either you believe it that they really put a man on the moon or you think that it was a hoax and they pretended uh, Stanley Kubrick directed the moon landing. Whatever you believe, they focus, they shift our attention to outer space, space travel. Why did they do that? Because there's nowhere else to go, but we need to keep the economy going, right? Also, the, the concept of modernity itself is a modern concept. Yeah, that makes sense, right? It's a very late concept here. In 1980s or so, 
we start talking about modernity, you know, and uh, overpopulation. I want to check one more. I'm almost done with these phrases, by the way. I'm going to have a little look at the comment section in a bit. I'm going to try to sum it up before I do that. Overpopulation, nobody cared about overpopulation until 1915, the First World War. All of a sudden, hey, that's funny, the First World War, let me zoom in. First World War starts right around the time here. Okay, right around the First World War, okay. That's when we start worrying about overpopulation all of a sudden. Yeah. All right. Was there, no. I'm gonna to try to summarize this for you. What I've been doing for the past 50 minutes or so, I've been going through these engrams, which show you the frequency of phrases and words in the literature, in the English language literature of the past 500 years since around 1500 AD. And it does show you what I call real history. Because there is the history written by the victors that can be totally deceitful and treacherous and lies. And then there's the real history, which is you know, what concerns people? What are people writing about and thinking about in the literary record? The topics that they find interesting reveal or betray what I call real history. So we know, for example, based on everything that I've showed you so far in this video and this podcast, um, is that from around, largely from around 1600s to 1750, we have an age of deeply religious life. Christ and, uh, Christ and Christianity are very important to us. And then from around 1750 to 1900, I would call that the age of civilization. So we've done Christianity, right? We've worked ourselves out. We've gone through the spiritual growth age, basically. Then we arrive at an age of civilization. We care about humanity, the climate, uh, platonic love, right? We start caring about other people, about Islam and Buddhism. What are they doing, right? And so we come up with all sorts of concepts. But then we shift into a different gear. Uh, under the influence of Karl Marx and, and Marxism and the revolutions of 1848, we arrive around 1900, from 1900 to 2050. I would call this our age, the age of technology, but also the age of decline. So we got energy, technology, wealth, a middle class, We've got uh, luxury items, we've got, we, and we start caring about what else to do, the galaxy, outer space, right? The moon landings, we, we, we really transform ourselves into a religion of technology almost. We make, te we make technology almost religious, right? We look up to Neil Armstrong as though he were Jesus Christ walking on the moon, right? Uh, and that brings me to the following. I want to make one more prediction, a really big prediction. I feel as though what I've been looking at, what I've been studying, because I started studying this yesterday as well, right? What I've been studying so far, it kind of looks like it's going to come to an end around the year 2050. 2050 to me marks kind of like the end of a cycle here, the end of a phase, the end of an age. The age of technology comes to an end primarily because our ruling classes, the elites, I call them the elites. I don't care what you call them. Call them the cabal if you want. But this cabal, they're out for the Western middle class wealth. They're going to take the wealth away, kill off the, the Western uh, middle class, and that will kill off a lot of hope and aspiration. You're not going to have space travel if there's no middle class to build you, uh, to care about spaceships, right? And then what? What happens when this age of technology comes to an end? I imagine there will be a war, a big conflict between now and 2050 or around 2050. It can be later, it can be 2060, but there will be a really big conflict and war in the Western world, a death struggle or a death rattle, as you, say, as you might say. Like when a snake dies, they have a death rattle, right? So you have a death rattle of our people trying to stay alive, probably losing out. But is that really the end? No, it's not. Because... What our job is, I think, the people of the right-wing movements, the nationalists, it is our job, our job precisely to preserve the seeds of our spirit, of our people. And when it, with seeds, I literally mean seeds of people, pockets of people. We need to somehow figure out where can we send our people to start new colonies, to start over. Colonies, say, in the sub-Arctic, in the woodlands of Western Eurasia, for example, or even Western Canada or Alaska. There are tons of places on earth where we might 
plant the seeds of our revival. And I predict this kind of growth phase, like the, the planting phase, may take another 150 years. So because of what I've been looking at are kind of phases of 150 years, which is like five generations of 30-year-old people or six generations of 25-year-olds or seven generations of about 21-year-olds, right? So which doesn't, um, depending on how you classify a generation, 20 years old, 30 years old, it come, everything come, seems to come in cycles of around um, gener five to seven generations or so, roughly, right? It's not delimited like that, but it's roughly five to seven generations you enter a new phase. We are living close to the end of a final phase in Western civilization that has been going on for the past um, 600 years or so. And we are entering a new phase, a phase of new beginnings, a phase where we plant the seeds of the revival. And the revival then, I would imagine, would be from the year 2200 AD to 2500 AD. We will have another 300 years of very powerful life to live, a new future. We won't be a part of that, but it is our job now, living so close to the end of these phases, it's our job to figure out how to pass on what is important. What do we really care about? Do we really care about diversity? No. What do we care about? We care about our healthy stock, our athletic people, our smart people, our creative people. We care about them, right? We, we want those to live on and to have children. So we're going to have to focus our resources and our efforts into uh, investing in precisely, precisely those groups of people that we want to live on and make sure they have a place to live. Just like Israel is a place for the Jews, why can't we have a dozen Israels or more? Why can't we have a hundred Israels for our people all over the world, right? You have Orania in South Africa, for example, these colonies for white people, places where we can start experimenting with new ideas, where we revive our religion. I showed you also that we are actually living in a Christian revival age. The late 20th century is, a, is an age of revival of Christianity. Why? Why? Because after so much technology, people are looking for something they can truly believe in again, right? So religion becomes important. We need to pass these things on, right? And help our people ahead. So, uh, well, that was sort of what I was trying to tell uh, during this podcast. So uh, let's see. Uh, I know there's been a ton of people watching and commenting. I haven't paid, it, I haven't paid attention to your comments. I, I'm, t I'm sorry about that. But uh, this is like my live podcast, so I, I had to go through the whole program to discuss everything. And I'm going to see if I can answer some questions still belatedly. Uh, I hope you thought it was interesting, though. I see a lot of comments over here. Okay. It was all right. It wasn't too bad. Uh, yeah, someone, someone asked, uh, you know, I, said, I think Eastern Europe will stay white. Yeah. I'm not so sure about that. Poland has been captured by the U.S. system, by the way. And so you can expect Poland now to bring in like hundreds of thousands of Indians, for example, because they, I told you they believe in Indo-Europe, Indo-European, right? So they're actually going to send you Indians and say, well, well, you're part of the same thing anyway. Well, how are you different from that? And that's just so crazy. I think Eastern Europe is going to uh, see uh, tons and tons and tons of Indian immigrants. <coughs> You're not going to like it, but that's just how it is. I thought you may remain. I've been to Romania to a, a place of the Cluj, Cluj Napoca. I didn't. I thought they were white people. I had no idea that you think they're not. I thought they were white people. They look white to me. So anyway, uh, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to put my uh, this episode on my uh, YouTube channel at the Great Johannes. You can subscribe to my newsletter at www jmk.info jmk are my initials and you can also check out my link tree and so on whatever uh and so yeah i have a twitter account at johannes mkx mkx johannes mkx and you can find most of my i have my link tree on my tiktok profile bio you can click on that link and find my other links there i'm also on telegram at johannes mk and let's see uh, lots of other things. Okay, thank you for watching. I'm going to wrap this up.